Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. Arc Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by ARC. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by ARC or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by ARC to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of ARC Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of FYI. I'm Nicholas Gruss. I'm an analyst at ARK Invest, and today we'll be talking about the creator economy. On the show, you'll hear from Nishita Jain, an ARK associate working on the fintech team, as well as our very special guest, Seema Gandhi, co-founder and CEO of Creative Juice, a platform and network helping to empower creators. So with that, let's get into it. Seema, thank you so much for joining us today. We're super excited to have this conversation with you. And maybe just to start, we can hear a bit about your story, the founding story of Creative Juice, and then we'll kind of just jump in with questions about the creator economy, your company, and everything else we're going to get into today. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me here. You guys are such innovators and forward thinking that it's a real pleasure to be here and chat about something that I care a lot about. So a little bit about me. I spent the last 20 years of my career in financial services from you know working at the U.S. Department of Treasury to American Express and most recently working at Plaid. I was early number 15 there and, and watching that company grow and change fintech. And so I have a real passion for helping people live better financial lives. I think after health, like financial services is a way to really fundamentally help people improve the quality of their life. So last year I left Plaid and after that amazing run was just taking some time for myself and trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And I honestly didn't think I would go operate again. And then I met Ezra, my co-founder. And you know, while I was doing financial services for the last 20 years, he's been spending time in the creator space, working with YouTubers and really seeing that whole ecosystem grow. And I got really taken with the creator economy. And I, as I started to dig a little bit deeper and understand more around how creators were building businesses and changing traditional mechanisms of distribution from you know content, entertainment, merchandising, I started to really appreciate the power of the creator. And I also just really love how creators are kind of of the population of the people. You can, as an individual, look and see a creator that really relates to you in a way that is very different than, you know, growing up in the time of Leave it to Beaver TV, where you're kind of served what you get by some type of institution. And these micro communities and people finding people they identify with their sense of humor, like that's just super cool. And so you can think of Creative Juice as a little bit of a founding story of fintech meets creators and has a baby and that's creative juice and what we really want to do is help grow the creator economy and do that by helping every creator business reach their full potential and when you say that what exactly are the products you're building at creative juice how exactly are you trying to help the creators grow their businesses i think the number one thing that we're doing right now is helping creators understand their business and appreciate that they are a business and so what the first product that we've launched is a dashboard that helps you take your different business metrics, whether it's on YouTube or Instagram or Patreon, and convert them into tools to help you think about matching your monetization and your growth metrics. One of our first unlocks was really creators are really focused on growth, what their followers want, their subscribers want, and taking that and converting it into a language that matches with monetization and how you make money from that is actually a missing link. And So that was the first thing that we've done. And so we're showing creators things like evergreen metrics. You know, when you look at your videos on YouTube, for example, what percent of your content is evergreen, meaning it continues to perpetuate a certain amount of revenue. And that's creator YouTube gold. It's passive income that you don't have to do too much around and it just continues to generate revenue. And if you think about it from a business perspective, that's something to be really mindful of because as you think about your different income sources, you want to diversify with evergreen content and merchandising content. And so these are the types of things that we want creators to start thinking about. Obviously, there's passion for what they're building and there's a lot of creativity, 
but we hope that layering in the metrics and making them really digestible and clearly connected to the channel's growth can help give them some ideas or a better understanding of how their business is going to grow and change over time. So that's the first piece. You know, one of the other things that we have done is really appreciate that for creators and for any business, candidly, as money comes in and money leaves, that starts and ends with the bank account. And so that's where we're starting. We're starting with the bank account. And you can check it out on our site right now, getjuice.com. What we've done is really think about what works for creators. So there's a bank account, but we, we consider that table stakes. It's not super exciting. But what's wrapping around the bank account is where it starts getting super exciting. So think about partnership rewards for where creators spend. b h Camera, Beacons, Gigster, you know, things that creators actually spend money on. The other things that we're doing are helping link all of the different income sources across platforms and types of income, whether it be affiliate or merchandising or AdSense revenue or brand revenue, and show that to creators and then break it down. So in one place, you can start to understand the breakdown of your revenue by type and by platform, and then also what your expenses look like. And so for a lot of creators, we do that. It gives them a lot of insight into what that business looks like. And we'll actually also show them projections, which helps them plan their business. It's, if you know what your income is going to look like in the next two months, you can start making decisions around how you're going to spend for editors or your video posting cycle and, and things like that. So the bank account is something we're really super excited about because it helps creators separate their business life from their personal life and organize it in a really cool way. And we're continuing to layer more and more insights on top of that, like rate cards. How much should you charge a brand? And we're kind of picking away at all of the pain points that creator businesses experience today and using the insights that we get from the bank account as a way to make that even better and richer for them. Got it. That's super exciting. And maybe kind of touching on that, you've mentioned some of kind of the pain points and current tools. So before Creative Juice, what were creators using and like what financial tools were actually available to them to be able to manage their business well? Many of the creators that we speak to say that they aren't thinking about it. I think if you're a small creator or what I'd say like a mid-tail creator, you're actually commingling a lot of your personal and your business expenses. And so you don't have a lot of clarity into that. And a big pain point we've seen is come tax season. So we'll actually be helping creators also prep their taxes where it's, you know, there's so many stories of, well, my brother's sister's fiance's friend did my taxes for me. And there's a failure to appreciate that you have to pay estimated taxes. And what we've heard a lot is that creators, you know, come tax payment time will actually be scrambling to get brand deals so that they can make the payment on the taxes. We really want to take all of that away and that pain and that friction away from creators so that they know what to expect and that they can continue to just focus on creating and building their business. Yeah, I think another question that I think we're really curious to hear more about is just you mentioned that you know a lot of creators weren't managing their finances well and they weren't really keeping track of a lot of the information that you're now providing them. I'm just curious on the end of how like specifically are you bringing in creators? What are the responses you're getting from creators after they're actually bringing in all of these new toolings? What's the reception there? Very curious. Let me be clear. I think you know creators have been relying on inefficient ways of, of managing their business. I mean, the reality is that they have been managing their business and doing a tremendous job of it, especially given how new this whole economy is. And what I'd say is that you know there are a lot of folks, like managers, agents, that you know oddly enough manage a lot of the creators' money for them. And I can't think of another industry besides entertainment where this happens, where brands and other payments go to the manager and then the manager takes their cut and then gives the money to the creator versus the money getting paid to the creator and then the creator making sure that the manager gets paid. And I think that's it's a very slight but powerful change of money flow because if the creator sees all of the money that's coming in and leaving their business account, ultimately the manager is more accountable to the creator. And so that's something that we're really trying to shift, which is creators should and hopefully help creators get more comfortable owning their money and understanding their money and so that they're more empowered to control that. In terms of the feedback that we're getting from creators, I mean, overwhelmingly, it's been super positive. I get super energized whenever I chat with creators who are saying, we really appreciate what you're doing here. I wish I had these tools earlier. And I think there's so much more for us to be able to do in terms of taking away the friction around simple things like invoicing or getting payment from brands faster. And you'll see a little bit of this with our Boost product where we're starting with AdSense and helping creators manage their cash flow better. I think overwhelmingly, there's been so much positivity from creators. We've spoken to 
I've personally spoken to over 100 creators on 101s, just kind of UX research and walking them through the product. And the thing that I take away is how much more there is for us to do. And Seema, just taking a step back here, how big is the creator economy? I would say that it is infinite. (laughs) And the reason why I would say that is I think the creator economy is going to ultimately be the distribution for almost all of the traditional things that you would consider economy. So if you think about entertainment, I think the creator economy is encroaching into that now with YouTube. Today, um, YouTube is only about 20% of network ad spend, but growing incredibly fast. And let's take the Olympics as a recent example. I think these past Olympics were the lowest actual viewed Olympics, but the Olympic viewing on YouTube grew by 7x since 2016. So when you look at where people are shifting, it's into traditional verticals. So I think there is just so much potential for creators to grow into that. So however, I will give you a number. A lot of estimates from sources will say it's about 50 billion today. But like I said, I think the potential is infinite. Maybe we can just, you know, also running with this infinite possibilities. I'm very interested to hear how working with so many creators, how you have come to define creator and what does that actually mean? Yeah, it's such a good question because in the beginning I was as I was getting my head wrapped around this space, I was thinking to myself, what's the difference between a creator and an influencer? And what's it mean if you're on Etsy and you're building crafts? Are you a creator or are you not? And look, I think the lines are a little blurry, candidly. The way I define creator is someone who produces content online, so digital content. And so I'd probably really be looking at folks on YouTube, Instagram, Patreon, Substack, and they cut across different verticals from entertainment to merchandising to journalism and much more. Got it. Got it. And I think there's been a lot of kind of technical innovation, I think, in this space that has created this creator economy. And so I'm curious from your perspective, what do you think are kind of the defining shifts in the way technology works with, for people and the way that businesses have evolved that has brought about the creator economy? Yeah, I focus on three big trends. So first, and we've all heard software is eating the world. And I think that's helped facilitate the creator economy. If you think about things as simple as your phone on your iPhone and the power within those cameras, Apple has every other phone carrier has made it much easier for a creator to cheaply get started. Uh, You don't have to go out and buy a massive expensive camera. You can just use your iPhone. Not to mention the fact that editing software is so much better now. So I'd say software is definitely one of the tools that have helped facilitate the creative economy. Second, flexibility. You know, in 2026, America will become a majority freelance economy. And there are over 65 million freelancers today. So when you think about what that means for building a flexible business, which I'd, I'd say creator economy fits, fits squarely within, the fact that there's so many freelancers who are helping with editing or photography or video like helps power that creator business. And then third, monetization. YouTube paid out $30 billion to creators over the last three years, and Patreon has paid out $2 billion, and we're just getting started. So the fact that creators can now make money from what they're doing is really important. You know, As their businesses mature and move beyond just platform payment to, you know, like I said, merchandising and other just more traditional, traditional air quote, products, I think that creators are going to be able to stitch together income from a variety of different sources and continue to make and monetize into a life, you know, what they do for a career. Got it. That's very helpful. And I think you've, we've spoken a bit about this, but there's a lot of different platforms that creators can use, you know, whether that, you know, and and different types of ways that people can create. So curious from your perspective, what are kind of some of the most, I don't know, lucrative platforms or where do kind of creators start off and like, how do they build their business? And are they using multiple platforms? Or do we usually see them kind of stick to one? Creators definitely use multiple platforms. And I think that's an important insight and something we're helping them understand is just what the revenue looks like across different platforms. In general, at least in this moment in time, what I see the life cycle for creators looking like is they start on TikTok because it's easier to produce content. And if your video goes viral, you can build followers really quickly. They move to Instagram and then finally YouTube. And YouTube is today the most, for most creators, profitable platform. Uh, I think if you're a creator that relies mostly on brand revenue, maybe Instagram would be the most profitable one. 
so those are probably like the three biggest platforms I'd see and, and that's the life cycle. But what I'd also say is that it is changing so quickly. TikTok is doing a tremendous job adding ads seamlessly without ruining, you know, or undermining just like the connectivity that creators and their followers have or viewers have. They're also helping creators monetize and help people shop on TikTok. Instagram is doing the same thing. And so I think that this world is going to change very quickly. And I'm very intrigued by what Twitter is doing as well in terms of helping creators connect their audiences and create different spaces and, and tiers for them as well. So I think this conversation will be very different in a year. Seema, in the past, we've talked about, and what I think Creative Juice is at is this intersection between fintech and the creator economy. And we've talked in the past about the evolution of fintech. And I'm just wondering to get your thoughts here. We've talked a bit about the creator economy, but just want to understand you know, the evolution of fintech, where we are in this story as it meets with the creator economy and all of these other verticals. Yeah. So the way I think about fintech is really we're in the third inning of fintech or fintech 3.0. And fintech 1.0 was really going from analog to digital. And I think banks would have been really excited when they had their online pages and they had a mobile app. And that was fintech 1.0. And, you know, candidly, there's still parts of the financial services ecosystem that are still in fintech 1.0. Every time I have to mail a check, I kind of cringe. Fintech 2.0, I'd like to say plaid. Obviously, I'm biased, but I think Plaid really helped FinTech 2.0 come to life. And that was the ability to take your bank account and connect into different apps and to have different types of services that your banks couldn't provide or did a pretty subpar job of providing be available to you in alternative sources. And FinTech 2.0 is thriving and continuing to grow. And it's super exciting to see. And then I'd say we're now in Creative Juice is squarely within FinTech 3.0, which is taking your bank and building vertical SaaS solutions around that. So your bank account, candidly, you know, it should be a very fungible item. And hopefully as you know, FinTech 2.0 continues to thrive, it becomes very easy for you to switch where your bank is. And what is attractive about the bank is more the solutions that are surrounded by the bank. Like I said earlier, for a business, you know, your income and your expenses start and stop with your bank account. And that's a really powerful insight. Like any software provider should be able to take that insight and be able to give you tons of services that make your life a lot easier. So Creative Juice is in that 3.0 bucket where the reason we launched the bank account isn't because the business is the bank account, but it's because it enables us to do so much more and solve so many more pain points for a creator. So we're going to continue digging into FinTech 3.0. And I don't know yet where 4.0 comes from or where we go from here, but I think we have you know plenty of space and opportunity for us to continue pushing 3.0 and what it means for creators to enjoy services that are really connected into their bank account and streamline a lot of their operations. Got it. That's super helpful. And then curious as we're looking to the future and, and bringing out FinTech into the future. And also on the end of where does the creator economy actually go from here? And, and what other tools we built? Obviously, we're talking a little bit about kind of how creators manage their finances, their businesses. What other places can this economy go? And then what other businesses or platforms will be built on top of it? Yeah, I think platforms have a long way to go to help creators monetize. And so we're going to see tons of innovation there where fundamentally creators are generating a lot of this content and attracting viewers, but there's still more opportunity for them to get a share of the value that they're creating. I think YouTube is leading the way there, but other platforms as they continue to come into market will help creators do that as well. And that's exciting because that helps creators in a really like central place be able to monetize. A second thing that I think we'll see is creators switching from being the name to actually that business and becoming like having clearer ways of being able to do that. A lot of the, I'd say, leaders in the space, including you know Mr. Beast, taking Mr. Beast Burger and launching brands around his name or Addison Ray saying, I'm not going to just go sponsor someone's makeup line. I'm going to actually create my own called item. And there are platforms out there like Pietra and Spring that are helping creators actually own that product that they're trying to create are going to also be a more common way for creators to build businesses around them. So it's not just a name. And then, you know, and on that point, I, I get a lot, this, I get this question a lot. Well, you know, creators are just a name, like they're not a business. I'd like to remind people, Laura Vanderbilt, Calvin Klein, a lot of these different big businesses started off as a name, Ford, Motors. And so there's an opportunity for these creators to really extend beyond just them as a person. 
And then third, I think we're going to see a lot more brands starting to plug into the mid-tail and long-tail of creators. There's obviously been a lot of attention on the big the big hits, right? Charlie D'Amelio, Addison Rae, you know, these bigger names in the space. But brands can actually more effectively target some of their core customers by working with creators that are focused on that segment. And so as the tooling out there becomes better, that's going to be awesome for brands who want to reach their core target versus just, you know, top of the line brand building. And it's going to help creators who are smaller or medium sized also get a bigger share of brand revenue. So with these three different trends, I think that we'll see a further acceleration of the growth uh, within the creator economy. Seema, you've mentioned a lot of big creator names. I'm curious, what defines a creator? Like, What is the minimum tier you need to have on one of these platforms? And then what does the revenue ramp up look like as you gain more followers, as you're more popular on other platforms? I'm wondering if you can just help break it down a bit because the creator economy is so big. There's so many verticals. You can be a creator in almost anything, but what does it really mean to be a creator? What are some of the biggest categories? And then how much can you expect to make? Yeah, that is the question I so often get. And what I'd say is, you know, I think that creators are just going to continue to make more and more. And the second thing I'd say is that I think it also depends on where you live. A lot of creators are starting to make a living doing this, but they're also living not in New York City or in LA. And so let me kind of take a step back though and answer your first question, which is really around segmentation and how we see that. Every creator starts off with that one follower, right? Just that, that one person that subscribes. And generally what we see is in that zero to $500 a month bucket where you're just getting out there and you're super focused on finding your voice online and building a follower base, like money is not top of mind for you. It's about growth and optimizing for growth. And that's where our dashboard comes in. We want creators to understand things that drive growth and how they should thinking about healthy growth for their business. But I'd say like zero to $500 like a month, you're really starting off. And it might be a hobby. It might be something that you're seeing can get enough traction that you can actually go and do full time. And those are probably the two biggest profiles we see. Like hobby or... I, I, I want to see if this works so I can go do it full time. Once you hit 500 to 2000, I'd say like you're kind of squarely within the creator middle class and you may be making AdSense revenue, but you've got other types of revenue as well, whether it be merchandising and you're starting to branch out into different platforms. And as a creator, if you're in that 500 to 2000 bucket, like you generate enough momentum that if you invest more time and focus into it, you can move into the next bucket. And then generally, when we see folks making more than $2,000 a month, it's they're, they're doing this full time. They've seen momentum, they figured out what works for them, they found their voice. And you know, the thing that gets me super excited is a lot of them still really love what they're doing. They're doing it not because of the money, like the money obviously is a great thing, it enables them to do it, but they are just so elated that they can be doing the thing that they love to be doing full time and making a living off of that. And that is super cool to be able to say, I wake up every day and I do what I love to do. Speaking a little bit about the platforms that creators are using, what do you think of the take rates that some of those platforms are taking, whether it be YouTube or the TikToks of the world? This is like a very controversial topic. I think fundamentally what creators need is the ability to own their own data, their own email lists, to be able to port from platform to platform so they can vote with their feet. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of platforms today, creators find themselves trapped into that platform because that's where they built their follower base. And if we can help creators make the platforms a little bit more fungible, I think that'll align incentives more clearly. At the end of the day, I think platforms recognize that the creators are bringing the value and they should be recognized for that. And there's definitely opportunity to monetize with creators. Like there should be aligned incentives there. So I think platforms have to think really hard about what that means and how they're going to stay successful, especially in a world where creators can leave if they want to. Right. And then maybe shifting gears a little bit, we would love to hear a little bit about Juice Fund and the partnership you have directly with creators and how you've built that. Yeah, look, I think we started off talking about our bank account and some of the tooling that we're doing to help creators today with taxes, you know, and, and different discounts at places that they spend and you know, really feeling like we have their back and helping them think through their business. I think more broadly, there's a lot of interest in investing in creators and we want that to be possible and we want that to be happen 
on the basis of business metrics, not hype investing. There are a lot of platforms out there that are talking about, you know, crypto investing in creators and it's based off of follower account or who's trending. And I think that doesn't give enough credit to the fact that creators are actually businesses and that we can actually look at the metrics for how they're running their business, like the quality of their revenue, run rates, projections, and help investors make more business-based decisions on who they're choosing to invest in. And the only way for us to really do that, given how new of an asset the creator business is, was to start investing our own money and put our money where our mouths are. Mr. Beast has long said, I want to help make the world a better place. And I really want to help other creators grow. And he was the perfect person to say, yeah, I believe in this. Let's do this. And so we partner with him to help get the word out, to help you know add legitimacy to the fact that creators are businesses. He's such a great example for what it means to be an entrepreneur and be a business and take your brand and make a business around you. Depending on when exactly this comes out, we'll have announced a few of our investments out of the fund. And we're really excited because that helps prove to the market that we can generate really consistent returns off these. And our longer term goal is to make this more scalable. So creators of any size and any creator can come in and, and say, you know, I want to be able to sell off a video or I want to be able to monetize my asset in a way that other businesses would that are more part of the mainstream and better understood by institutional investors largely. Got it. And the part I love is how this is a community of creators coming together to bring more creators to the space. And I think that's really, really exciting. And who are some of your favorite creators? I'm a big skier. I love to ski. I don't know that I'm the world's best skier, but I, I love it. Like I think there's nothing better than being outside on the mountains with snow and just I love it. And what that means is that you show me any skiing video on YouTube and I can spend hours <laughs> watching people <laughs> ski on mountains and looking at their technique and watching them do different runs. So I'd say pretty much any type of ski stuff on YouTube is top of the list for me. I also say my four-year-old dominates YouTube. He will remind you that he doesn't watch cartoons. He watches YouTube and he loves watching marble runs. So I watch a lot of Marble Olympics and Marble Run on YouTube as well. <laughs> and Seema, one last, last question from me. What are you most excited about going forward in the creator economy? You mentioned you have some products coming up. Maybe you can give us a little insight of what you have. And just you know, overall for this space, what are you looking forward to the most? Yeah. So on the product side, well, before we jump into product, I think you should go check out our website, anyone who's listening to this and check out the design. I have to give a lot of credit to the design team for how they've thought about the website and what it means to be a fintech operating within the creator space. The design will not look like your traditional bank, but we really wanted to be creative and we actually have artists in their own right to designing the website and a lot of our visual brand. And I hope that really comes through that we're not just kind of in the box thinkers here. We want to be creative and partner with creators. And then in terms of the product, like I said, you know, the dashboard is there for creators of any size. And we hope that's really a great top of funnel for creators who are just even starting out to understand how to think about their business. And as they graduate, you know, understanding that they should have a separate business account so that they can manage their money, their income, their expenses in one place. And it helps them manage their taxes better so that they're tracking expenses and can deduct that from their business income when that happens. And you know, giving them the tools that they feel can help them advocate for themselves, like the rate cards. What we found is that a lot of creators feel very alone in this journey. And so we want to be that bank of record for them, but we also want to be their partner in this. And we understand what they do for a living. And and I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to continue to go down that path. And, you know, one of the things that we'll be launching is Juice Boosts, which help creators manage their cash flow. So YouTube pays out on June 1st. You may not get that money until June 26th. That's over three weeks of waiting for your money. And that might mean not being able to hire an editor or not being able to get that camera during which you could have you know, filmed two videos and posted. So we really want to give creators more control over their cash flow as well. And you know, in terms of what I'm most excited about, there's so much to do. We've only been building for about six months. And I get really excited when I can actually feel like I'm giving a full suite of services to creators. And I have to say, like some of our earliest supporters and, and fans have just been amazing in terms of the feedback they've given. They've really been patient with us as we go on through product iteration and seen real sausage being made. And I'm just going to be really excited what we can say at scale, like every creator can experience 
a tool that helps them build and take the stress out of it so that they can focus on being creative. ARC believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that ARC believes to be reliable. However, ARC does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from ARC. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions, and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.